Okay, so you've seen the movies like Minority Report and Iron Man where they use their computer in the space around them. But how would you actually use that in your house or office today using existing technology? These movie interfaces are really great because they make something seem more powerful or intelligent for storytelling in the film, besides being nice eye candy. But if you're going to use one in real life, you probably don't want lots of little animated text and graphs. What you would want is something clear and easy to use. So I did a manifesto video before about VR, UI, UX, R, N, D. Uh, the gist was that we're humans and we can use our instincts to our advantage when we're making this new thing. This new thing being some kind of operating system environment with multiple applications, but uh, around you instead of 2D like your computer or smartphone or kiosks. Uh, this video is a summary of some of those more useful workflows I've found in the last few months, partly for the uni, but also for the VR community. So I'm using this mouse to scroll through my presentation and the numbers you see sometimes in the corner are citation references and I'll try to keep it under 20 minutes. Of course, real life like this is a 3D interface and we can look at information design in the real world or our interactions there. But to do this kind of full digital interface, we'll use a head-mounted display. So if you're even watching something like this, you probably already know that it's like headphones for your eyes. Headphones replace your hearing, this replaces your sight. So you look around and you see this new presented environment with scale and depth and size of things. So first of all, why is this even worth doing? Well, for one, more screen space makes computer workers more productive. Uh, you have fewer interruptions to tasks because less time and cognition is spent navigating occluded things in the interface. 360 degrees around you is kind of an end game for that. There's also Z-depth. Stereoscopic images and parallax from head tracking give you the illusion of depth, which is one of the ways that you naturally understand the world in spatial relationships. Letting users spatially organize tasks also means more productivity. And then on top of that, if a user can customize their working environment, they're going to be happier working in it. So you have happier workers who are significantly more productive if it's done right. And we all talk about the idea of this killer app for VR. Um, and we reference things like Doom. Uh, but around that time, probably the killer app was something like Windows or word processors as far as money. So since we've been using computers for a few decades, let's look at some of the things we want to do. We have content like pictures, video, text, and 3D models. We have applications to create and consume that content. We organize that content into groups, and we use metadata to search for it quickly. And then we have symbols and icons that represent actions and applications that cause actions. The little pictures help us find and recall them quickly by their shapes and color. They've always got text descriptions or a text name, though, and a lot of these actions we just put into menus as text. We use feedback like cursors, hovering, and audio to help us understand how our input is affecting stuff. And with a keyboard, we tend to switch tools and modify our actions on the fly. So with VR, we still want to have stuff, create stuff, organize stuff, do stuff to our stuff, and look at other people's stuff. But how does that all look? How do we keep it understandable? What is our graphical user interface? Well, here's something interesting. VR was actually invented before the first GUI. Uh, while you're probably familiar with those 2D UI things I just talked about, you might not know about some of the first VR things that already exist. There's the laser pointer kind of cursor where you can use it to select stuff or move it around, bring it closer or farther, rotate it. But you probably know how using a laser pointer or a Wiimote or something can be, it gets kind of like shaky. So sometimes they'll make it get uh, wider as it goes further out. Another way is like looking through a crosshair to select stuff, uh, kind of like aiming a gun. You can do this intersecting lens kind of idea to see inside of stuff. There's the world in miniature concept where you have a map of the environment you're in and you can affect the world around you using that. You can also move yourself that way. Um, speaking of which, there's teleportation where you can jump from one place to the next. You can do the cursor thing for menus in space, or radial menus extruding from the hands, or going around the hands, or associated with body parts, or any of the menus you've seen in video games. You can also switch tools or modify cursor actions with buttons or gestures. So now to start making some of these useful, we've got to think where they're going to go. 
So if I'm at work eight hours a day, I'm going to be lazy and sit. I'm also not going to be raising my arms a bunch because, hey, lazy, I'm lazy, you're lazy. We're all on this inevitable path to the WALL-E universe anyway, right? So for the last few months, I've been working with an Oculus Rift DK2, and then I've uh, got a Leap Motion attached to the front of it there. Uh, different types of devices and inputs will change this stuff a lot, but I'll explain my content zones concept for these specifically because it's what I've had access to. So, if you're sitting in a chair and wearing this thing, you've got a field of view of about 94 degrees, and it's pretty much circular because the lenses are circular. I'm going to pull some numbers from a great presentation Alex Chu did from Samsung. Uh, you can rotate your head to the side comfortably 30 degrees and max 55. You've also gotten up and down comfortable and max. Uh, if you combine that with the field of view, you have angles where people can see stuff and where they have to strain. Of course, this is for a non-rotating chair. If you're in an office chair that's spinning around, it's different. But let's just assume the most restriction, like the wire will tangle them up, or maybe it needs to be useful for an airplane seat. So they're just in a stationary chair with armrests. Samsung also had some uh, useful numbers on depth. If something's past 20 meters, you don't really see that much stereo separation, which is your depth perception. Uh, so beyond that, you'd lose that benefit. And then super close at about a half meter, things start to get straining or cross-eyed, like you don't really want to be looking at them for a long time. So no permanent interface stuff there. Now you've got this zone where you can see stuff comfortably and meaningfully. Office ergonomics say that if you're going to be reading stuff on a screen all day, it should probably be between 15 and 50 degrees downward and outside that strain zone. Now there's something called vergence accommodation conflict, where your eyes try to focus on something based on its distance. Everything is focused at the same distance of 1.3 meters in the DK2 though. Later there will be fixes for this, like planoptic light fields and tensor displays, but we're assuming the DK2 for this. That means if we're showing someone text for a long time, then it should probably default to those angles at 1.3 meters away, so that it's most comfortable. So now we have some good zones for laying out our content. There's this no-no zone right around the head, where nothing should be permanently. The main content zone. The peripheral zone where they can still see stuff, but you probably don't want them to be straining for necessary stuff. And then back behind, I would say, is the curiosity zone, where they've got to literally turn their body to see. And then outside of all this, you get to a point where the two views pretty much are rendering the same thing pixel for pixel. It's basically monoscopic and should probably just be part of the skybox at that distance. This gets further and further out with uh, devices as they get higher and higher resolutions. And then within that content zone is the main work area, especially at that comfortable distance. So if you're going to be using this uh, leap motion to touch things with your hands, it's going to have to be in arm's reach. But again, lazy, and it's also only really accurate at about two-thirds arm extension anyway. And nothing should be in that no-no zone, so we can subtract that. And voila, a touch interface zone. You can also put stuff around the hands, uh, but on this first version from Leap, you can't really cross the hands. It uses infrared silhouette to build the bones and mesh for the collision, so you can't really intersect reliably. But things outside are okay, like their planetarium demo or um, Zach Kinstner's hovercast menu. So I made a template file to use in projects with these zone borders. Uh, it's a lot like how you have title and action safe guides for video editors, just some guidelines for content where you can put things. I tried testing these zones out by putting signs in them at random spots and checking out how they felt. I also made a demo with buttons and had people try them, just turning things on and off. People seem to get it right away, so that's good. So yeah, moving right along, since we're talking about buttons, there's some stuff I did with that that's relevant. Uh, Leap Motion has some widgets that they provide, including those buttons I used. I thought maybe I could design some that would fit with the whole aesthetic of this VR OS thing, though. So buttons let you cause an action. There's lots of different kinds in real life. And this video is already going to be too long to go into their history, but Leap's idea of compressing a plane to an action point seems normal. So I mocked some up, chose some styles, and I tried animating their different states, thinking that it should communicate your proximity when you've contacted, when it's activated, and then when it's reset. Of course. Uh, th there's that whole thing where your finger is going through it, which seems unnatural. Or does it? Uh, if the whole thing's supposed to be based on human nature, then maybe this should too. 
So where in nature does your finger go through something like that? Maybe the surface of water. So I made a palette based on some more natural colors. There's that aqua color that doesn't necessarily occur that naturally that often, but we associate it with water anyway. Figure a color will be better than the cost of rendering clear refraction. There's the color of wood or the skin of palms, uh, thinking that maybe it might inspire some kind of intimacy with the interface. Uh, there's blood red for alerting. And then I was thinking, what about loading time? Like, is there any natural thing that inspires patience? And I think maybe campfires and sunsets tend to make you sit peacefully, so maybe this orange for that. I restyled the buttons and then tried animating them for more based on this submersion idea. I think it's pretty nice. It's not necessarily like our real life buttons or like our 2D screen ones, but it seems to make sense for the medium. Uh, maybe the color scheme's lame, I don't know. Anyway, back to that intersection thing. We seem to see it as kind of a mistake when things go through each other, uh, but in a digital world, that's probably fine. It's more like a natural property of a VR interface. Like, instead of a 2D slider, you can put your hand into a cylinder and move it up and down. Like, you don't have four plates in your cupboard, you just have one plate, and you can take as many of it as you want, like a sim or something. You condense things to collections, like folders on your computer, so that makes sense. Okay, so let's have a hypothetical user do something and then we can put together what that might look like. Uh, I looked at apps people use most now and categorized them by their primary tasks. So then I used some of those to make kind of a user narrative for some simple ones. Um, so we'll say we've got this lady and she's got a business where she does 3D scanning for museums. We're going to say she's got an office space with a chair, and she'll be using Valve's Vive headset. She's got one of their motion controllers in one hand, and then the other one is being tracked in space so that we can look at both of those at the same time. We're just in generation one of these products, so we're not going too far into the futurism. Um, we're just using existing hardware and existing uh, content. So, all right, she's thinking about getting this Artex scanner, and she's watching one of their 2D videos. She scrubs ahead, intersecting the progress bar, and then pushes a button to pause. Now her interface is in that comfort zone there, and the video is at movie theater size and distance because she's in full screen, or the VR equivalent of full screen. She exits out of that, and now she's back in her custom environment where she's got apps running. She opens up the user manual, and it defaults to comfortable distance. She scrolls through it a little bit with the controller's thumb pad, and then she sees an area where she wants to speed read. She selects the first point and highlights the area by making a gesture with her left hand and clicking the second point. She pulls up the menu, navigates to speed reading, and activates that. So that's going along and she's adjusting the speed, but oh, she set an alarm to remind herself she needs to go meet with this prospective client in an hour. She's still gotta grab lunch, so she'll just do it on the way. She turns to the personal assistant and asks, what's a good place to eat by the Museum of Art? asks to see those on a map, selects one, and gets directions. Then she sends those directions to her phone so she can use that in the car to go there. All right, so this one-handed thing is kind of like a mouse and keyboard. You can see how little things about the interface would change if they were both controllers or if it were a multi-touch surface or something. So there's also the possibility of other content types, like maybe that video isn't 2D, but a photogrammetrically recorded demonstration at some point. And then what if it's a different head-mounted display, like the HoloLens, for example? Well, then you'd have a real office as the background, and the field of view for interface stuff would be a bit narrower. So that would affect a lot of design choices. All the elements would need to be light colors, because it's additive only, no black pixels. It's just reflected light projected in that rectangular area and that's fine it's still super impressive technology and people won't be disappointed in the actual product as long as it's marketed honestly anyway what i found in trying to communicate these concepts was that i needed a design workflow so what i've been doing for rapid prototyping is making three after effects compositions to use as foreground midground and background like in theater and film then you can apply a design grid to each of them and use them as spheres around the camera in a final comp. 
This grid here has a line every five degrees, and that lets us line up the field of view of the device in a composition that has the resolution for one eye. We can pretty easily color the sections of those zones from earlier because they're associated with degrees. So then we can make a quick mock-up of animations of interfaces and solve a lot of UI and UX problems that way. So this is one where I applied that for a Google Cardboard app. To pass that on to developers, I also add a section to show when the user's pressing the button and notes on what's going on. So I could probably talk about this stuff all day, but I figured that that stuff was probably going to be the most useful with zones, interaction concepts, and mock-up workflow. Some of the other stuff I've been looking at is workflows for avatar creation between 3D modeling, photogrammetry, and 3D scanning. Each has their pros and cons. And then I was also looking at um, adding convergence and depth to monoscopic photos and videos, like the difference between a photosphere and a dome or distorted mesh, and then whether a depth map channel would work, like an alpha channel. The short answer is that it's not ideal. It kind of works, but it's not the best because you're missing the occluded stereo information. Then there's the side of VR with social acceptance. Uh, people get worried about the ethical implications of VR, but obviously we'll be coming up with systems to address those issues as they arise, just like film, radio, TV, or video games have done in the past. And really continue to do today. So I've been looking at that stuff, uh, practicing my 3D and Unity stuff, um, giving a couple talks here and there, participating in social VR, and then also doing VR for some hackathons. And then there's plenty more uh, concepts for that OS and interface design. But the question for me is what comes next? Uh, well, I've just finished this master's and so Personally, I'll be looking to probably relocate and work in VR wherever the opportunity is best, but with this VROS concept, I think it's viable. Um, I think it's the kind of thing that you could do a round of funding or a Kickstarter for, but realistically, it would probably start out as individual applications. Permanently rendering can be kind of tough on current PCs, and 2D content like emails isn't really what the medium is best for. It'll be totally necessary for architecture pretty soon, though. Content that's inherently 3D, like medical imaging, product design, model sculpting, maps, schematics, and education are some of the things where it becomes a necessity more than a gimmick. And I doubt I need to tell anybody watching this about the storytelling side. So we're making the next creative medium with the current creative medium. Thanks.